Well, this has been a very good exercise for me to prepare for tonight because I don't believe I've ever prepared a 14-page handout before. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to say, since I can't imagine Derek Thomas will listen to this tape, and I know he's not listening uh, tonight, that the amount of work that goes into preparing the outline and handout, I think probably triples the preparation time. And so if you are benefiting from these studies, do your mightiest to encourage him, uh, because uh, we've a long way to go. Um, and we're commanded in Scripture to do that anyway. And since I'm not doing these studies, it gives me an opportunity to impress upon you the importance of giving encouragement to those who minister the Word of God to you. It will not only help them, at the end of the day it enables them to feed us a great deal better. Now, Derek, of course, has planned all this out. He's in Scotland, freezing in 45 degrees um, in Scotland. Um, but he obviously planned his whole life here so that I would get the practical session tonight. Uh, he's not prepared to risk me with the theology, but he thought maybe I might know something about uh, how to read the Bible. And I want to try and do that in the time that is at our disposal, essentially by working through this outline, but uh, I'll miss some of it out, but by uh, giving a number of clues, essentially, to how it is that we ought to approach the Bible and the principles by which we should study the Bible, read the Bible personally. Uh, first thing to say is this, by way of illustration, uh, earlier on this morning, I was, uh, I was in my study at home, I came downstairs, I pulled a pile of books off the kitchen table where I'd been looking at them at breakfast time, and Dorothy said to me, are you getting rid of these books at last? And I said, no, actually, uh, some of you will have noticed, I recently purchased a new Bible with bigger print. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, I really just came down to get my Bible. Because, I said, naively, I said, since I've bought it, I might as well use it. Since I've bought it, I might as well use it. And those of you who know my wife know that she would minister to me at that point. Um, but perhaps that's the most important thing I can say tonight. Uh, you do not learn to read the Bible by not reading the Bible. And you don't actually learn to read the Bible by coming to lectures on how to read the Bible. It's like learning to eat. How do you learn to eat? You don't read cookery books. You ring somebody up on your cell phone and you say, how do I get from the cookery book to the food? Because it's the food that I really want to eat. And so tonight it's about how we get to eat the food, how we get to use the Bible. We might not immediately think about this, but it's not exactly rocket science that if we want to learn how to read the Bible, it's just possible the Bible itself might have something to teach us about how to read the Bible. I think one of the most amazing things I find in the Christian church today is that people think the Bible is there to tell you how to get saved and then you're on your own. But the Bible is here to give us instruction about everything we do for the glory of God. It gives us principles by which to live. And so the scriptures that speak about the value of scripture, and here I'm thinking about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, while we think about those words essentially as emphasizing the inspiration of Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed, and therefore the authority of Scripture, if it's God-breathed, it speaks with the authority of God. But for Paul, his real concern here is to teach us what Scripture is for. And this is why at the end of this little section in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, he emphasizes that it has a fourfold use, a fourfold purpose. And that teaches us right at the beginning, if we just 
closed with the benediction, sang the doxology, and went home tonight, it would give us a very important but simple way of approaching our Bible reading. If this book is to provide teaching, if it's to reprove my conscience, if it's to transform and correct my life, which is vocabulary from the medical field in which you might correct something that was distorted in the human body, and if it's meant to equip me for Christian service. You know, one of the things I'm going to be doing when I come to any and every passage of Scripture is to ask the question, how is this passage of Scripture useful for any or indeed all of those four things? And Paul is laying this out in the context in which he speaks about the value of Scripture. Second thing to say by way of introduction is how important it is to know how to study Scripture. Notice what Paul says here, 2 Timothy 2.15. He's speaking to Timothy about the way he handles Scripture. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And there are these two elements here that I think it's important for us to get hold of. He speaks about being a workman. That's a great challenge to us. Are you working at Scripture? The Scriptures do not yield their treasures to people who are not prepared to mine in the Scriptures. And uh, so getting to know the Bible, learning by practice how to read the Bible, it does not happen to those who are lazy. You know, one of my favorite proverbs is the proverb about the slothful man, the sluggard who reaches his hand out into the bowl to get the food, but he is so lazy he just can't be bothered bringing the food back to his mouth. And it's a very telling proverb when it comes to the food in Scripture, doesn't it? It speaks about the importance of working at it, and that means setting time aside for it, doing it in a disciplined way. But not only that, but handling the Word of God properly, and that's what we're going to spend most of our time on this evening, handling the Word of God properly. Paul says again to Timothy that... Uh, since Scripture is useful for these four things in our lives, one of the things we need to do, he, he realizes he's writing the authoritative voice of God, think over what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding. So our posture as we, as we learn to read the Bible and to study the Bible is that in reading it, we meditate on it. And in meditating on it, we are not only fixing our eyes on the pages of the text, but we are lifting our heart to the Holy Spirit to ask Him to help us to understand it, and especially to help us to apply it. But since Paul speaks about rightly handling the Word of God, uh, it carries the implication that it's possible for us wrongly to handle the Word of God. Remember how Peter speaks about this, 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17, a passage that's appeared earlier on in a quite different context, where he refers to Paul's letters and places them in the category of Scripture. But he says, you must know that there are people who distort the teaching of the Scriptures that God is giving to the church through the Apostle Paul. And uh, if ever there was a day in which we can be conscious of that just because of the explosion of the media, whether it be radio or television or the newspapers or, or websites or all that you can download from the World Wide Web, it's all the more important for us to learn rightly to handle the Word of God. And these challenges, I think, can be, can be fairly daunting. 
Uh, perhaps as uh, Derek has worked his way through the first part of our study of Christian doctrine, you've, you've found that daunting. The important thing for us to underscore here is that uh, God did not give the Scriptures for rocket scientists. He didn't give the Scriptures for university graduates. Um, there were very few people for whom and to whom the original Scriptures were written who had any kind of education at all. Many of those who first were given the New Testament were slaves. Some of them had very low levels of education. And uh, the principle that's enunciated in Scripture, just by the way Scripture speaks, is that if we approach the Scriptures appropriately, then the Scriptures will disclose their meaning and their significance to us in a way that, as Paul says, will really begin to transform our lives. And this is one of the things we've referred, Derek's referred on several occasions to the Westminster Confession of Faith and especially to the first chapter that's wonderfully brought out there in the first chapter that, that everything we need in order to be able to glorify God is set down in Scripture or may be deduced from Scripture. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can come to a clear understanding of what God is saying in His Word. Notice particularly the words that we find in section 7 of the first chapter of the Westminster Confession. It tells us, that what we need to know or believe or observe for our salvation is clearly propounded, expounded, and opened in some place of Scripture or other, that not only the learned but the unlearned in a due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. That is to say, you do not need to go to a theological seminary. Theological seminaries sometimes are good things. You don't need to go to a theological seminary to become an expert in the teaching of Scripture and knowledgeable of what it is and how it works. Um, just speaking from a purely personal point of view, um, I went to a very by and large, very liberal theological seminary, where by and large they had no interest in us knowing the Scriptures as the Word of God. And many gospel ministers have been in that situation. Some of the ministers you have most admired will not have gone to conservative theological seminaries, and their names are popping into some of your minds. So how do they learn how to handle Scripture the way they handle it? In exactly the same way you would do by coming to it, seeking the help of the Holy Spirit, and using what the Westminster Confession calls the ordinary means of understanding the Scriptures. Now, let me try and unpack what those ordinary means might be. Notice at the bottom of page 2 uh, some of the points that are made there that give us a summary of what we've discussed so far, especially the fourth of them, the central teaching of the Bible can be understood by a simple disciplined use of the means God has given us to interpret them. But just as a word of warning, notice what is said in section 9 of the first chapter of the Confession, that we interpret Scripture by Scripture and the true and full sense of any scripture which is not manifold but one may be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. It's that point that the meaning of scripture is one that I think is important for us. Because probably some of us have been brought up in a context it may be a church context, maybe the kind of teaching that we've listened to, maybe the kind of preaching that we've heard, that by and large approaches the Bible uh, as though its real meaning was hidden in some higher level of reality. 
Uh, I've given an illustration there of uh, famous exposition of the parable of the Good Samaritan in which the author of the exposition, one of the most famous individuals in the early Christian church, goes down through the parable and tells you what it really means. Um, and by the time you've worked your way down through that list, you'll discover the parable means something quite different from what apparently Jesus thought it meant. What Jesus thought it meant was, here was a man who showed mercy. Because the question he asks at the end of the parable is, so uh, which of these men proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? And the answer is, surely the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, well, the whole point of this is, you go and do the same thing. Now, he's doing something very clever because the man has said, who is my neighbor? Can I limit them to the people who come on a Wednesday night? Are these my neighbors? And Jesus says, that's not a real issue. As long as you know who's your neighbor and who isn't your neighbor, you never grasp what the gospel does. So Jesus' question is not, so who was the neighbor of the Samaritan? Jesus' question was, who proved to be the neighbor? And the man said it was the one who showed mercy. Jesus says, the whole point of this parable, you've grasped it, so you go and do the same. So this parable has got nothing whatsoever to do with the man falling among thieves, symbolizing Adam, Jerusalem, uh, symbolizing paradise, Jericho symbolizing the world, the prophets, and the, and the Samaritans symbolizing Christ, and the wounds symbolizing disobedience, and the inn being the church, and the two coins, the sacraments, the innkeeper, the head of the church, and uh, so on and so forth, and the Samaritan, the, the, uh, the neighbor's return being the return of Jesus Christ. You may even have heard a sermon preached like that, and you've gone out thinking, wow, I never saw that in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And there's a simple reason, because it isn't in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's in the imagination of the preacher's mind. But I think in our subculture, many of us have had influences on our lives where we feel like, you know, I can't get to these deep truths that this man is presenting. Uh, my favorite, actually, while I'm thinking about it, actually comes from the Old Testament scriptures from Second Samuel chapter 9 uh, and verse 13. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. He ate always at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Now, what's that about? Well, according to uh, some expositions, uh, the fact that the text says he was lame means this is about depravity. The fact that it says he was lame in both feet means that the Bible teaches total depravity. The fact that he lived in Jerusalem is really a picture of justification. The fact that he had his meals at the king's table is teaching us the doctrine of adoption. And uh, the fact that he ate there continually is teaching us the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Now, all of these doctrines are true, but none of these teachings have got anything whatsoever to do with this text of Scripture, which is why the Westminster divines, in concert with wise Christians in every age, are saying, just see what the text is actually saying. Don't try to look underneath it for what's hidden or for what's above it that might knock the socks off people if you explained it to them. Just listen to what it's actually saying. Of course, that's the real challenge, isn't it? It's the most difficult thing in the world for most of us just to listen to what the text is saying because we tend to tell it what it should be saying or we tend to read it simply in the light of what we know. And so, in learning to read the Bible, um, learning to read the Bible is not a one session on a Wednesday night activity. Learning to read the Bible is a lifelong activity of allowing the teaching of Scripture to challenge and to reshape the way in which we think. And if we're going to do that, 
then I want to suggest there are a few principal things that we need to grasp. And uh, here I think I've actually listed five of them, which will make some of you wonder why there are six points. And the answer is because there ain't a point number five. First question, is there a key? Um, Now, this is kind of obvious when you read any book. When you read any book, the key thing is, what is this book about? Um, And sometimes we can be so deficient there, can't we? Um, Actually, often, I, I find often when Bible readers read the Bible in the morning, the only thing they want to know is, what is God saying to me today? And I want very uh, gently to suggest to you that isn't what the Bible is for. It's not a book of little hints as to how, how you get through the day. It's a book with a message that shapes and encompasses the whole of your life. And it's that that I think we really need to learn when we read the Scriptures. Well, first of all, is there a key? Answer, yes. Jesus provides us with the key to understanding the Bible. John 5, 39 to 40, you search the Scriptures, he says to the Jews, because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, what's the key point here? He's saying the Scriptures are actually about me. The whole of the Scriptures are about Jesus miss that, and actually I could gain a lot of bits of knowledge about the Scriptures, but I wouldn't have grasped what the Scriptures are really all about. And this is the very thing that Jesus enlarges on to his friends uh, on the Emmaus Road, Luke 24, 27, uh, when they didn't recognize him, you remember, on, on Easter Sunday afternoon, and we're told by Luke that beginning with Moses, that's the first books of the Bible, and going through all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, the Old Testament about which he was speaking as a whole is a preparation for Jesus, but it's also clear here that Jesus must have as they walked along the road for this two-hour session, that Jesus would have said things like, do you remember in this passage? Did you ever wonder about that passage and this passage? And he must surely have walked them through the big passages in the Old Testament that hold the Old Testament together, that show the development of the revelation that God was giving to his people in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. And later on, you remember, when they ran back and the other disciples uh, were gathered there and Jesus appeared, how marvelously Luke says, that Jesus then opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he did exactly the same thing. He went through the law and the prophets and the Psalms, and showed them how they pointed to his coming and his death and his resurrection, the theme that Paul picks up when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. From childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So our first principle is this, is there a key What is the book about? Answer, the book is about Jesus. You know, we could ask that to the children on a Sunday morning because they know the answer is sin, God, Bible, or Jesus. (laughs) And in this case, it's Jesus. And alongside what we've learned from 2 Timothy 3, that introduces another element, doesn't it? That as we study the Scriptures... At the back of our minds is always going to be this question, how is this passage connected to Jesus? And how is Jesus connected to this passage of Scripture? Now, that's the key 
Then we want to move on secondly to unlocking the Bible as a whole. That's what stands in the center. We're looking for Jesus. In the Old Testament, we're looking for the way in which it points forwards to Jesus, and it does that in many different ways. In the New Testament, we're looking to see how the New Testament points backwards to Jesus and upwards to Jesus and forwards to Jesus so that at the end of the day we get to know the Lord Jesus better and by getting to know him better become more and more like him because the Bible is a book that has a specific goal. It's an instrument in God's hands to make us more like our Lord Jesus. But where does this fit into the whole story? Well, the Bible begins with Genesis 1 and it ends with Revelation 22. It begins with God and creation and it ends with God and a new creation. And from beginning to end, there is a major character, God himself, revealing himself as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And there is a plot line that runs through the whole of the Bible. And it's this plot line that I think is so important for us to grasp. Actually, within the plot, there is a plot. And within the plot, within the plot, there are other plots. And all of them together add to our sense of the, the riches of the teaching of Scripture. So actually, the first thing to grasp is what I've called the biggest story. The biggest story of all. What is the biggest story? The biggest story is that God made the cosmos for his glory. He placed man at the center of that cosmos as his image. And he placed man in a temple garden. The Garden of Eden was a temple. It was the place where God and man met with each other. Adam walking in the cool of the day with God. And one of the reasons we know it's right to call it a temple is when we read about the tabernacle and later about the temple, Solomon's temple, in both of these constructions there are strong echoes of the Garden of Eden. It's hints to us to say there is the Jerusalem temple, there was the movable temple, but there was originally the garden temple. And the call that was given to Adam was this. Adam, I want you to expand the walls of this temple until they fill the whole earth. So that throughout the whole earth, my glory might be displayed and my name might be honored. And presumably that meant there would be children and they would uh, extend a little further the garden and so on. It would go until the whole earth was a garden for God's glory. But of course, Genesis 3 tells us how Adam disastrously failed, how Genesis 4, his family was dysfunctional and in disarray, and the whole story goes on until you get to the end of the story. And the end of the story is in Revelation 21 and 22. And what's it about? It's actually about a garden temple. The new Jerusalem comes down, and if you've read Revelation 21 and 22, the description of it is like a description of Eden. There's a river running through it. It's a beautiful garden. The trees fructify every single month of the year. The really interesting point is this. We're told quite deliberately, in this new garden, there is no temple. Why? Because everything is temple. That's the whole point. It's that what Adam failed to do and lost, God has restored and finalized through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the book of Revelation is called the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
which he gave to his servant John. And that's the great big picture. This, I believe, is why uh, John tells us in John chapter 20 on the morning of the resurrection, when Mary meets Jesus in the garden of death, John slips in. She thought he was, what? The gardener. I think John is saying, and she was only half wrong, because his resurrection, remember we spoke about his body being the temple that would resurrect. His resurrection was, as it were, the very beginning of this new creation that God was bringing into being, which the book of Revelation tells us at the end of the day will fill the cosmos with the glory of God. That's the big story, actually the biggest story. The bigger story that fits into that big story is the story that's described after the fall in Genesis 3.15, which, uh, as, as we keep on saying, is one of the most important statements in the whole of the Bible. The rest of the Bible is actually about Genesis 3.15, when God says, I will bring a curse upon the serpent in order to bring a blessing upon the man. And you'll notice if you reflect on Genesis 3.15 that there are three things here. First of all, there is the declaration of a conflict between the serpent and the woman. There is a description of its continuity. It will go on between her offspring and the serpent's offspring. And there's a description of a climax. This conflict that will go on in continuity will come to a climax when he, when he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, what he's been speaking about is the continuity of the conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. But now it comes to a climax in the personal conflict between the seed of the woman, and you just need to think about how that word flows through the Bible to realize that ultimately it comes to its consummation in the Lord Jesus, whose heel is crushed even as Paul puts it. He overcomes Satan and makes a public show of him on the cross. Now, if we are to understand how the Bible works when we read it, we've got to have these three elements in place. There is a conflict, and it runs through the Bible. It's continuous. And this conflict is moving towards a climax that we find in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if I can just give a little hint, every time you see a conflict in which a child of God or the people of God are involved in the Scriptures, at first you're likely to say, oh, that must have been so. But if you're going to read the Bible well, what you've got to see and say is, oh, that's part of the conflict. That's one of the principles that holds the Bible together. And when you, when you see what happens to this promise that God has given of the seed, and that's a notion that keeps on recurring, you, you begin to realize, oh, what's happening here isn't just an isolated instance. It's connected to what I read about earlier on in the Scriptures. When God says to Abram, for example, in Genesis 12, in your seed the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, that's not just an isolated promise. That's profoundly connected to the original promise about the seed. So that as we grasp some of these principles, it's, uh, is it a bit like a kaleidoscope or maybe it's more like a Rubik's Cube? 
half of us in the room can remember the Rubik's Cube, you know, that, uh, you know, the pieces are all over the place. But once you begin to see the key to bringing them into place, the whole thing that was such a jumble actually begins to make sense. So there's the biggest story, there's this bigger story, and then there's the big story, which is, how is God going to bring this promise to pass? And the answer to that is, and here are two big Bible words, he plans to establish the kingdom, kingdom of his grace and glory. And he means to do that by way of covenant with his people. He plans to establish his kingdom of grace and glory. That was what Adam had lost. He was given kingdom. He was given dominion, Genesis 1, 20, uh, 26 and 28. But he lost it. So God is establishing his royal dominion. Now, what, was, uh, what were the first words out of Jesus' mouth when he began to preach? The kingdom has come. So you see the connection. And then you see how there is a kingdom built among God's people in the Old Testament that serves as a kind of pointer to and a, a securing of the people for this final kingdom that God will bring in. And the way in which he does that is by making covenant pledges to his people that he will fulfill his promise to bring them salvation and restoration. So when we read the story as a whole, in these shorter stories that we find in the scriptures, here are three things to do. Keep your eye on the plot line. Ask what's happening to the covenant promise. Because so often when you read the scriptures, you realize the issue in a story is the covenant promise of God has fallen to the ground. So you keep your eye on the covenant promise. And then thirdly, you read the narrative in the light of the ongoing conflict that's been promised here in Genesis 3.15. And if you know the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is really the movie version of how that comes to a glorious climax in the most appalling battle in which Jesus Christ is victorious. Now, I've given two, on the outline, two simple illustrations of that. Let me, uh, let me just refer you to the first of these, and you can look at the second of them. Well, the second of them's good, isn't it? What do we teach the children in Sunday school when we read about David and Goliath? We tend to teach them. This is a story that means you little guys can beat up the big guys. It's got nothing to do with little guys beating up big guys. It's got to do with the conflict it's got to do with the fact that this big guy is bent on destroying the kingdom of God and God's people. That's what it's all about. It's massively bigger than the little guy with the sling and the stones out of the river. It's about God's kingdom and how the serpent seed is seeking to destroy it, but how God is keeping his covenant promise. And the other illustration from the life of Joseph in some ways uh, is just the same. It, it looks, I used to love this story when I was a kid and wasn't a Christian because it was one of the greatest boys' adventure stories in the world. But you see what it's all about. It's actually about how God and his providence is going to fulfill the promise that was given in Genesis 3.15 and has narrowed down in Abraham, and Abraham has been told as part of God's covenant promise, by the way, just by the way, you lot are going to end down in slavery. But after several generations, I'm going to bring you back up again. So you see Joseph going down into Egypt, and it looks like a personal disaster. And you see all the sin that's involved in that, and yet in the mystery of God's providence, it's his way of getting them down 
to Egypt in order that he can bring them up again at the right time for the right place. And so the experiences that Joseph personally has, and this is a very helpful thing to grasp when you read the Bible, the way Joseph is constantly being dragged down, humiliated, demeaned, virtually dead, and then is marvelously raised up. Why does that happen? Because this man is holding on to the promise that is set within a conflict that will ultimately be resolved in the death and resurrection of Christ. And it's not possible to hold on to the wire without experiencing, as it were, the current running through your body. And that's why this this, uh, pattern recurs again and again in the pages of the Old Testament Scriptures among believers. That the promise looks as though it's been abandoned, but it's not. That the conflict looks as though it's being lost, but God intervenes. And the individuals who are involved look as though they're going down into the pit, but God marvelously brings them up. So that's the plot line. But in addition to the plot line, we need to learn to join the dots. And the simplest way of joining the dots is to understand God is doing this big thing of restoring his kingdom of grace and glory by means of his covenant bond with his people. And you'll notice in the outline I've listed where there are eight or nine uh, passages of Scripture that hold the whole of the Bible together in the way in which God enters into his covenant promise with Adam and then with Noah and then with Abraham and what the New Testament calls the old covenant that's made with Moses. And then it focuses down on David and his family and it leads to a promise of a new covenant so that eventually at the time of the institution of the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, now this blood that I'm shedding, this blood is the new covenant. This is the final covenant being fulfilled. So grasp the big picture. Why? Because if you grasp the big picture, the little pictures begin to fit into place. And they're not just isolated uh, stars in the sky. They're, they're part of the whole tapestry. Have you ever been taken to an art gallery or listened to a piece of music and an expert has said, now, let me tell you what this whole thing is about. And you think, I just thought it was a man sitting at a funny box banging these black and white things. So I thought it was. I thought he was pretty good at it. But... Or it sounded nice. And uh, the expert comes along and he says, yes, but let me, let me put that into the picture. Let me tell you the story of that composer. Let me tell you the context in which he was composing. Let me tell you where music was before he composed. Let me tell you about the other composers he was quoting in his composition. And then you listen to it, you think, my, oh my, you know, there I am, I've been listening to the Beatles. I've been wasting my time. There is this, there is this glorious music by somebody called Bach, and I had no idea it was there. And the Bible works the same way. Why does it work the same way? Because we're human beings. That's how we work. And so grasping the whole story is such a help to us. But then, once we've grasped the whole story, there are actually books in the Bible. In our Bible, there are 66 books. They come at us one at a time, by and large. You can't read two, you know, I can watch two television shows more or less simultaneously. It's a waste of time watching only one, isn't there, men, if you can watch two simultaneously. But you can't do that with Bible books. And so we understand that the Bible itself has a shape. So the New Testament speaks about it being divided into the law and the prophets, remember in Luke 24, and the Psalms, which uh, 
in that context probably include other books as well. That's the, the Jewish threefold division, essentially. The law, the first five books of the Bible, the prophets, and then the writings. Now, when we come to each of these books, and we understand this well in connection with other literature, one of the helpful things for us is simply to say, what kind of book is this? As we say here, a, a book that begins once upon a time works differently from a book that begins in 2013, the earth was covered in debris, or one that begins in 2012 in Columbia, South Carolina. The first is a fairy story. The second may be a piece of science fiction. The third looks as though it might be a piece of historical reporting. And these different kinds of literature work differently. I mean, we all realize that. Um, your, your mathematics textbook works differently from the Lord of the Rings. Even Dr. Thomas, the great mathematician, and expert in the Lord of the Rings understands these two, these two totally different kinds of literature. So one of the things we ask when we read the Bible is, what is this I'm reading? Because although it's all bound between the same covers, very different kinds of books. And I want to mention five different kinds of literature that we find in Scripture. There are more but certainly these five give us a great start. First of all, there's narrative. And about almost half of the Old Testament is in the form of narrative. And I think most of us think, well, those, those are the books that we don't need any help to read. And that's probably a danger signal. Uh, because there are things that are important for us to understand about Bible narrative. One of the things we need to understand is what we've just been saying, that these are not isolated stories, that they belong to the big plot. And unless we have the big plot, we might miss that as the central thing that's running through the story. Take David and Goliath again. David and Goliath is there to tell our teenage children to be big and brave. Well, I would only say that if I'd actually missed the plot. But if I'd grasped the plot, I would read that narrative and say, this isn't just about some boy hero. This isn't, this isn't a superman. This isn't superboy story. You know, David having got his kryptonite uh, into his little pebbles and flying around his head. Something more going on here. Yes, the big story is going on here. But in all biblical narrative, there is a kind of pattern that works, and it's, it's basically simple. First of all, there is the historical setting, particular time, particular place. Within that context, there will be a specific situation described. Within that situation, think about the context of the big plot line. Within that situation, a problem is going to arise. Why? Because the promise is always under attack and the kingdom of God is always engaged in conflict. If Jesus builds his church, then the gates of hell, of hell will seek to prevail against it. It's the way it is in the big picture. And so I'm looking for these things. I'm looking for, so what is, what's the problem that's arising here for the people of God, for the individual, for the kingdom of God? And then, of course, because God always wins in the long term, there will be the turning point. And the turning point will lead at least temporarily, to a resolution, and that resolution often will then become the setting in history for the next situation and the next challenge and the next turning point and so on and so forth. Now, on the handout, I've used the book of Ruth, which is a short narrative and a very beautiful narrative, just to give some indication of how that works. 
And how it is that if you read only chapter 1, which is the chapter most people know, then you not really get how this narrative fits in to the big picture. You've got Naomi back in, uh, in Bethlehem, and if it ended there, you would think, well, I think I can see, I think I can see the, the conflict, how this family has been has been uh, wandering from the covenant promise of God by going to Moab. And and now she's back, but uh, she's back without her husband and her two sons. So it looks as though she loses, and it looks as though God loses. But then the story goes on, and it keeps repeating this idea. There's a setting, there's a situation, there's a problem, there's a turning point, and there's a resolution. And as it goes on and on to the end of the book, because we are Western readers, we would never think that the end of the book, and especially the genealogy at the end, well, maybe if you're South Carolinian, you would think the genealogy might be important. But outside of South Carolina, genealogies are boring. But it's only when you read the genealogy that actually you stand back and you say, oh, now I see how this fits into the big picture. Because the genealogy tells you that this little family are ancestors of King David. And the very last word in the Hebrew text of the book of Ruth is David. And that's actually what the book is about. Yes, it was about Ruth. Yes, it was about Naomi. Yes, it was about Elimelech. Yes, it was about the boys. But actually, this is part of the big picture. This is part of the picture of how David, the great king, is David the great king? And then you see, because we've got the whole plot line, we know more. You see, the author of the book of Ruth must have been living at the time of David, mustn't he? At the earliest. Because he knows this is David's family tree. But funnily enough, we've got this little white page in the middle of our Bibles, and we turn it over to the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel. What we discover? We discover this family tree at the end of the book of Ruth. It's Jesus' family tree. And that, you see, the big picture is actually essential to understanding the little pictures. I don't think I'll say anything in this context about... uh, Gospels, except to emphasize, since they are also narratives, uh, almost to beg you on my hands and knees, this, this must seem so dumb. But when you read the Gospels, look for Jesus. Now, why do I say that? Because in my experience, when people are reading the Gospels, they're looking for themselves. And if you are, I have heartbreaking news for you. You are nowhere to be found in the Gospels. You may have the same name as some people in the Gospels, but you're not in any of the Gospels. Why not? Because they're not about you. They're about Him. So when you read the Gospels, especially if you've been taught, or dare I say it, if you've sat under a public preaching that has constantly said, now where are you in this Gospel story? You've got to get that baggage out of your head. Because the gospel stories are not about you. If that's what you're looking for, what you'll find in the gospel stories is you. And if you haven't learned from the gospel stories, no you can save you. So look for Jesus. Now here's the kicker. That's actually a lot more difficult for most of us than to look for ourselves. Because we are so self-obsessed. And we've been taught in our subculture the really important thing when you read the Gospels is how they apply to you. That would have boggled the mind of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What they wanted us to do was to find Jesus in the Gospels. Incidentally, this is the reason why I think most Christians could talk much longer about themselves than they could about Jesus. And you know the sad thing? We do. 
don't we? And we're able so easily to think longer about ourselves than we are about Jesus. And part of the reason for that is that we're not listening to what the Gospels are saying, which is like the Father saying on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my Son, listen to Him. Well, look at the notes on prophecy. Uh, Look at the notes on Psalms, and especially because we all love the Psalms, uh, it may be helpful for us to understand how so many of the Psalms work in what I've called here, uh, near the top of page 9, a parabola shape. And I've given an illustration there from the 102nd Psalm. Proverbs, you know, one of the most important things for some of us to learn about the book of Proverbs is the book of Proverbs is not a book of promises. It's a book of Proverbs. It's not giving you cast iron guarantees. It's saying to you, this is a really crazy and stupid world, and this is the way it works. And so you need to be prepared for things that go bump in the night and learn how to handle an imperfect world. Um, So the Proverbs contain statements like, answer a fool according to his folly, and then in the next breath, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Answer a fool according to his folly. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. And if you've imbibed the book of Proverbs up until that point, you say, that's exactly what I've been doing. That's wisdom. And that's what the book of Proverbs is for. Two things about the epistles. One is, again, the importance of... So one of my friends puts it, if you're reading the letter to the Corinthians, you can't go directly from Paul to Columbia. He doesn't say that because he doesn't live in Columbia, but if he did live in Columbia, he would say that. If you're reading Corinthians, you need first of all to go to Corinth and listen to what Paul was saying to the Corinthians before you're able to apply that to yourself. Now, I've mentioned this fourfold grid uh, that is enlarged on in page 10 of the outline that is so practically helpful to us. Once we've begun to read the Bible in this way, then we are asking the question, what's the teaching here? And what is there in this passage that reproves me? How does it transform my thinking and my feeling? How does it train me in righteousness? And then how are we going to do this? Well, let me end with these three points that uh, I think are true to Scripture. The first thing is we're not left on our own to understand the Bible. Um, But sometimes I think we we might misunderstand what Paul says when he when, means when he says that we, we grasp the length and breadth and height and depth of the love of Christ with all the saints. Of first importance to us. Now you might think I'm saying this just because I'm a minister. This has been said in the church for its first 1900 years. The single most important thing I need to do if I'm going to learn to read the Bible for myself is place my life under an expository biblical ministry. Now, why do I say that? Because I'm an arrogant Scottish minister, that's why I say it. No, that's not why I say it. I say it partly from my own experience, but I say it largely because this is how most of us learn most things. You know, if if someone to come along and give us 20 hours on the detailed principles of the exegesis of Scripture, it would Oh, over our heads. So how do we learn most things in the Christian life? We learn most things in the Christian life by absorbing them, by someone doing it. And we, we begin to pick up 
how they're doing it and, and how they're studying the Bible themselves. So this is hugely important. The second thing, and I put this second deliberately, there is a third thing, but the thing of next importance is personal Bible study. Um, the third thing is group Bible study. But personal Bible study is second to public exposition and way before group Bible study. Uh, we are living in a time, I notice some people going to three or four group Bible studies in a week. And uh, I'm too polite to say, how much time are you actually spending studying the Bible for yourself? Studying the Bible for yourself. Because, you know, sitting around in a circle, listening to other people pitching in, uh, that may be helpful if it's brilliantly led and the people themselves have done their Bible study. Uh, but it can very easily become a very strange substitute for work. You know, most of us, we can fill our lives with all kinds of things to keep us busy to avoid working. I'm a past master of that. Um, and I can justify it to myself. But serious personal Bible study is on the decline. And we need help. Help is at hand. Here are two books that should be in every single Christian home in our congregation. And you can buy them for the price of about 20 lattes. So give up your lattes or your cappuccinos for a few weeks and you can have these splendid volumes. The New Bible Commentary, published by InterVarsity Press, worth it, I should say, for the commentary in here on Daniel alone. Okay? And the New Bible Dictionary. And with these two books, you'll be able to go a long way as a personal student of the Bible, as a father who's leading the family, that's actually the best place for group Bible study, incidentally, in the home and family. And the best news is that I spoke to dear Mrs. Kirkland, and she said she would have copies of these two, and as a set, you can buy them for $55. I'll sell mine for $60 this evening. <laughs> this is a great investment. You know, you can't even buy a good putter <laughs> or a good tennis racket or a decent pair of shoes. <coughs> but there's a lifetime of helpfulness in these two volumes, and I encourage you. And if you're really starting, I've included in here uh, what's called the Scripture Union USA method of Bible study. And that's the way I started. Um, and it's meant the world to me to have that. And there is a final point. I wondered if I should do this. You know, in the old days, sometimes some great Christian would die in the Middle Ages, and they would take off his clothes, and they would find he had a hair shirt underneath. You know where I'm going? I daren't do this although the youngsters would love me to do it. Do you know what's underneath this shirt? It's a Nike t-shirt. And emblazoned on the front are the words, just do it. I'm not showing you. I'll show you enough. There it is. Just do it. And honestly, dear friends, as I know Christians, as I know myself, that may actually be the most important thing I've said in the last hour, because that's the thing that you're maybe not doing. So, use the Nike method. Just do it. Incidentally, the Nike swoosh 
I discovered this getting my Nike swoosh here. And uh, do you know Nike paid $35 to the girl who did that? You can buy, incidentally, did I say this? You can buy the new Bible commentary and the new Bible dictionary for $55. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there is, there's, there's too much in the Bible, but it's, when we begin to grasp it, we, we've different ways of saying too much. Sometimes we say it when we mean we can't take any more, it's so awful. And, and we have this other strange way in which we say it, when what we really mean is it's glorious and thrilling. It's just too much. And we pray as we, as we are enriched these Wednesday nights and, and constrained to study, and as we read our Bibles at home and with our families, we pray we may more and more be a people of the Word who really know your truth and see the whole of our lives through its lenses. So we pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.